we're going to be talking about Pat Robertson and other end-of-the-world theorists, 2012, Planet X, all this kind of stuff that comes up, uh, where people are convinced that the end is nigh. The curious thing is, every time there's a prediction of an end of the world in the <laughs> proximate future, it gets falsified. It gets empirically falsified. Well, because but time passes. Yes. And the date passes that they've slated for the end of the world, and the world continues. Life goes on, except sometimes theirs. But the apocalyptic theorists continue to make new prognoses about the forthcoming end of the world. And very often these theories have an incubation period of sorts. They develop a sufficiently long time in advance of the supposed apocalyptic date that... Well, there's enough time to ramp up, gather supplies, yes. and so forth. Say the 2012 uh, prediction. The hype started around 2010, 2009 maybe. I think even before that, the groundwork was laid. I remember even before the year 2000, of course, a lot of people were predicting the end of the world during the year 2000 because it oh, was well, a nice were, round number. They but, were predicting the end of the world in 2000, and then many yes. people were predicting the end of the world in 2001. I think that there's a psychological backdrop for all of these end-of-the-world theorists, though, and that is having an end-of-the-world theory makes you feel important in some way. If you're part of the chosen few who are wise to it, the chosen few who have figured out that the end is nigh, it makes you part of a special select group, and it makes you feel really special. It's stupid, <laughs> but yes. I mean, why be so happy that the world is about to end? But I can see what the appeal is for some people. I think there's also maybe a kind of darker motivation, a kind of embrace of short-termism and short-term thinking you know, that is present point. in these adherents. I remember my freshman year of high school, we were made to read, in places a rather disturbing book in a metaphysical sense, by Alan Lightman, and it talked about various scenarios about how time could be different from the way it is. And oh, one of yeah. the scenarios was an end-of-the-world scenario where everyone knew that the end of the world was coming in X years, and because of that, they abandoned their everyday concerns and they became one big happy family, essentially. That's and extremely unlikely. It glorified that, but I think end-of-the-world theorists have that mentality. If there's an end-of-the-world, then somehow all of life is going to radically change and people will focus on the important things once again. Well, you know, I think it would be more likely to make people destructive and hedonistic. Like when there's a natural disaster, you see looting in stores and people break down windows and buildings and stuff and take advantage of whatever crisis they possibly can. I think that's much more likely in an actual end-of-the-world scenario. And to some degree, short-termism encourages certain kinds of bad behavior in the same way. Yes, and speaking of short-termism, I really do not get the expression that many people use, live each day as if it were your last. <laughs> live it's each day in to... utter terror and dismay. <laughs> yes, it's, it's somehow supposed to make a person really appreciate life and be good to others and do everything that that person has ever wanted to do. But in fact, doing everything that this person has ever wanted to do is, one, impossible in this kind of short time frame, and two, it would be psychologically unmanageable if one knew that one was going yeah. to die tomorrow. Honestly, uh, people say this only in the knowledge that they're not actually going to die tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If you were to really live every day as if it were your last, then you would probably go crazy eventually, honestly thinking, I'm going to die tomorrow, I'm going to die tomorrow, I'm going to die tomorrow. Eventually you get, might get used to it, and I suppose it might be a little different for someone with a chronic condition, like if you have pancreatic cancer or something. I can see how the phrase might mean something different to you than it would to the regular person. Mm -hmm. But uh, sick people rarely use this phrase. It's mostly used by well people who are attempting to encourage a short-term type philosophy. Yes, it's definitely a live-for-today philosophy, but really all great human accomplishments require time. They require perseverance. They require an accumulation of results. Each individual step is really very small in terms of the entire scope of the accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And so 
if you live each day as if it were the last, you mm -hmm. would be unable to invest in the future. Well, on the other side of the coin, though, if you live every day as if you don't get to enjoy anything for 20 years, then you're going to have a pretty miserable life. You need to balance the two. You need to try to have a little bit of short-termism and a little bit of long-termism, about half and half. I mean, you work all day, and then you come home, and you've got to take a break. Milton Friedman had this permanent income hypothesis, and the idea was that by consuming at a certain rate, saving at a certain rate, you could essentially guarantee yourself a kind of stable income, a stable standard of living throughout your life. Now, there are many complications to yeah, his I've, I've rather some, simple model. Some critiques of the permanent income hypothesis. However, I think the general idea may be a valid one, and also I've posited a parallel to that, the permanent enjoyment hypothesis. I think the idea is better. that there's a certain sustainable level of pleasure that one can maintain throughout one's life, because by enjoying yourself a certain amount in certain relatively harmless activities, you don't draw down your capital, your productive mm -hmm. capital, what makes yes. it possible for you to work and accomplish and create the conditions for enjoying yourself in the future.